Chemistry 3112, experiment 12.2a, the nitration of methyl benzoate. What are we doing in this lab? We're going to be nitrating methyl benzoate with nitric acid using sulfuric acid as our catalyst. It says here that this will also be a demonstration of the effect of an electron withdrawing group on a monosubstituted benzene ring. And so at the bottom, you see that we're taking this molecule, methyl benzoate, we're treating it with nitric acid and sulfuric acid, and we're going to ge generate a nitronium ion as an electrophile, and we'll end up producing the nitrated um, molecule, methyl 3 nitrobenzoate. And you can see that that nitro group goes into the meta position, and this is on account of an ester, this is an ester here, an ester being an electron withdrawing group. And so we demonstrate the, the effect of that electron withdrawing group and the fact that it directs the nitration at the meta position. Now before we do anything else, we need to talk about the safety concerns in this lab because you probably noticed that we're using sulfuric acid and nitric acid and those are very corrosive and very dangerous. Okay, They can cause severe burns. It says here that nitric acid is a strong oxidizer and you'll want to use great care when you're handling it. Of course, we want to wear gloves, and all of our PPE, safety goggles, of course. And of course, we are going to be enforcing PPE to the utmost in this lab because you do not want to be burned by acid, okay? It doesn't feel very good. It also says here that you are kind of encouraged to wear um, older clothes in case you end up getting, you know, a splash of acid on them. Even if it doesn't come into contact with your skin, acid um, can, it can put little holes in cotton. I've seen it happen many times. And sometimes the holes might not be apparent until you've washed your clothes, and then when they come out, they'll have little little tiny holes in them. So, yeah, just a word of caution there. Let's get back to the chemistry and talk about some background here. And, of course, in order for you to understand the chemistry in this um, lab, you have to fully understand electrophilic aromatic substitution. And this is covered in Chapter 18 in the third edition of Klein. It says here that in this experiment, the benzene ring of methyl benzoate is reacted with that mixture of concentrated nitric and sulfuric acids. And you probably heard me mention that you form something called a nitronium ion. Now, that nitronium ion is an electrophile, and the aromatic ring is going to react with that electrophile. The positively charged nitronium ion acts as the electrophile, temporarily disrupting the ring resonance and adds to the nucleophilic benzene ring, forming an intermediate resonance-stabilized arenium ion. Sometimes you'll hear that referred to as the sigma complex. The rate of formation of that arenium ion, or again, what is sometimes called the sigma, the sigma complex, okay, the sigma complex or the arenium ion, is stabilized by ring resonance. It says here that the arenium ion undergoes loss of a proton by a base, which in this case is going to be water, and then we restore aromaticity. You should be fully aware of this reaction mechanism and you should be able to draw this reaction mechanism before coming into the lab. A little more information here, that methyl ester in methyl benzoate, we can call this a carbomethoxy group and it says that the carbomethoxy group of methyl benzoate is electron withdrawing and thus deactivates the ring relative to benzene. And the resultant resonance structures that we see show why meta-substitution is favored over ortho and para. And of course, you should be able to um, demonstrate the fact that the carbomethoxy is electron withdrawing. We have a dipole going in this direction, right? We have a dipole going in this direction, which would be, you know, pulling electrons away from the aromatic ring. Now, in order for you to prepare the nitronium ion, our electrophile, you're going to react nitric acid with sulfuric acid. And what that's going to do is it's going to end up protonating nitric acid because sulfuric acid is a much stronger acid than nitric acid. It has a pKa around minus 9, so a pKa of around minus 9. And the pKa of nitric acid is around um, minus 1.4. Okay, and so again, that sulfuric acid is going to be able to protonate the nitric acid water will leave and we'll end up with our nitronium ion and we can show the arrows for that if we draw in the lone pairs on this oxygen we can show the water leaving like that and we produce our nitronium ion now here's the actual mechanism itself of the nitration so we have nucleophilic attack 
by the aromatic ring shown here onto the nitronium. And then you can see that all of the sigma complexes are shown here, or sigma complex or arenium ions. And what's important is that you see this positive charge that is delocalized throughout the ring. It is never, it never ends up on the carbon where the electron withdrawing group is attached. And that explains why meta is the preferred product. Now, I just told you that meta is the preferred mode of attack here, and we're going to get the meta product as our major product. But let's take a look at the ortho and para attack and why we don't see those products. Now, remember, the carbomethoxy group, or the methyl ester, is electron withdrawing. And so if you were to get the nucleophilic attack either at the ortho position or at the para position, you always end up with a resonance contributor, a sigma complex, where the positive charge is adjacent to a carbon with a partial positive charge, like this. And therefore, nitration does not favor the ortho or the para position. It is going to favor the meta position. A little more information about our electrophile. Our nitronium ion, which is formed in the reaction of nitric acid with sulfuric acid. Here's the balanced equation. It says here to make sure to slowly add the concentrated sulfuric acid into the concentrated nitric acid, not the other way around, and to use extreme caution. Be very careful when you're doing this. We're going to be doing this on ice, and we're going to kept, keep uh, the nitronium ion formation at ice temperature. So that means somewhere around zero degrees Celsius. The nitronium ion, and if we draw the Lewis structure again, which you should be able to do. So here's the Lewis structure of our nitronium ion. It says that the nitronium ion is not stable, and when the temperature exceeds ice temperatures, the electrophile or the nitronium ion is going to start to degrade and break down. So you want to make sure to work carefully here, okay? You want to guard that nitronium ion and to make sure it stays around zero degrees Celsius throughout the entire experiment. This is the mechanism, again, of the formation of the nitronium ion. We have protonation of nitric acid. That's what this is here. This is the Lewis structure of nitric acid, HNO3. Here's the proton transfer in the first step. Then we have the loss of water. So this is a loss of a leaving group here. And we end up with our nitronium ion. This is just a slide showing the reaction between our nucleophile methyl benzoate with the nitronium ion. So we have the nucleophilic attack on our electrophile. We have the arenium ion or the sigma complex. And again, you should be able to draw all of these resonance contributors. And then in the last step, we have another proton transfer where this proton is going to be removed in order to restore the aromatic ring. If you take a look at the ortho and para products, you can see that they have melting points that are vastly different than the melting point of the product that we're going to get in this reaction. So the meta has a melting point of 78 degrees Celsius, and the ortho and para have minus 13 and 95 degrees Celsius, respectively, as their melting points. Now you might be wondering, could I add a second nitro group if I had an excess of the nitronium ion? And the answer is yes, you probably could. But dinitration is a possibility, but it's minimized. And why is it minimized? Well, it's minimized, first of all, because we're going to have two electron withdrawing groups on the aromatic ring. Both the methyl ester, so this group, the methyl ester, and the nitro group, both of those are electron withdrawing groups. And so what that does is it deactivates the ring towards further substitution. Also, the fact that we're going to keep the whole reaction at low temperature throughout the entire lab, that is also going to minimize dinitration. This is what your experimental setup will look like. You see that we have the reaction set up. We have our 5 milliliter conical vial with our air condenser right here. And we have our spin vane. It's kind of hard to see it in there because we have an ice bath right here. This is an ice bath. Over here in this beaker, we have our nitronium ion being generated here by the mixture of sulfuric acid and nitric acid. You want to make sure that you have your air condenser clamped correctly like this. A little more on the preparation of the nitronium ion. We do that in the 3 mil conical vial, not the 5 mil. And make sure that you add 
that um, concentrated sulfuric acid into the nitric acid, not the other way around. Be very careful while you're doing that. Keep it cold the entire time. Again, the nitronium ion is not stable. And if the temperature exceeds zero degrees Celsius, the nitronium ion can begin to break down. And we're gonna be using disposable or plastic pipettes for the addition of the acids. Now, the volumes are not gonna be as accurate as they would be if we were to use a volumetric pipette, but we find it's much safer to use the plastic pipettes. Here's a picture I took in a previous semester of the concentrated acids. You can see that this one has the sulfuric acid in it, and this one is the nitric acid. So what we'll do is we'll set up the pipettes in beakers on the side, and do not put any of the acid that's in here back in this bottle, okay? You can take from this beaker here, and then if you need more, take it from the bottle, of course, open the stopper, or take the stopper out and take some out. It says here, do not pour the concentrated acids into the beakers holding the pipette. So don't pour. We will pipette, okay? So do not pour, only transfer, transfer you with a pipette, okay? A plastic pipette. If you happen to spill one of the acids by accident, and that very rarely happens, you'll have to clean it up using sodium bicarbonate. Because sodium bicarbonate is a base and it will neutralize the acid, but make sure to let your instructor know if that happens so it can be properly cleaned up. Don't try to do that on your own. Now what about the methyl benzoate and sulfuric acid solution in your five mil conical vial? Well, you're gonna to wanna to keep that on a nice bath as well. Measure out the required amount of methyl benzoate and then add the concentrated sulfuric acid. Keep it on ice and get it cooling and with spinning. Remember to keep the pointy side of your spin vane down and you're gonna keep this solution at zero degrees Celsius or thereabouts the entire lab. Remember to attach the air condenser with the um, rubber gasket, okay? So, or the rubber O-ring so that it will not become detached and again, always keep it cold. You notice that I say that a lot, but of course, that's because it's very important. If you look at our lab manual, where it talks about the preparation of the electrophile, the nitronium ion, okay? Again, we do that in the three mil conical vial. We add the sulfuric acid to the nitric acid. I want you to double the amounts of sulfuric acid and nitric acid. So whatever it says, for the amounts of nitric and sulfuric acid for the generation of the electrophile only, I want you to double those volumes. Now, how do we go about adding the electrophile to the mixture of methyl benzoate and sulfuric acid? Well, once both of those solutions are at cold temperatures, ice temperatures, or around zero degrees Celsius, you're gonna slowly add the electrophile with a glass pipette. You've gotta do this very slowly and carefully. In fact, the rate that you're going to add the electrophile is about one drop per minute, and it's going to take you around 20 to 25 minutes to get all of it in there. And you're actually going to be quite busy because you're going to have to unscrew the top off of the electrophile because you don't want air to get in there. Then you're going to take the drop, put it in there, take the pipette out, close the vial on the electrophile, wait a few seconds, open it back up. So you're going to do that a lot. So you're going to be very busy during the addition of the electrophile to the methyl benzoate and sulfuric acid. All right, when you're handling that glass pipette, you wanna put that glass pipette all the way down the air condenser so that the electrophile doesn't get on the sides. You want it to drop right into the reaction mixture. So make sure to keep the pipette vertical the entire time. Otherwise, you run the risk of having the electrophile squirt out onto the bench in your fume hood and you don't want that. Here's a picture of a student adding the electrophile to the methyl benzoate in sulfuric acid. You can't see, but there's, there is ice in here. There's not a lot. We kind of took some of it out so that we could take a good picture, but you see how the student is putting the pipette all the way down here where it starts to you know, get thinner and they have it all the way in there so that they can add the drops right into the reaction mixture. Now, how do we isolate the product? Well, you're gonna pour the solution over ice in a beaker, you let it melt, and then you filter it using your Hirsch funnel. Remember to cut a little piece of filter paper to put into the Hirsch funnel. Um, you can mass your ice before you need it because you need a certain amount. You'll have to refer to the lab manual for that. Addition, uh, after addition, stir the ice with a stir rod to help it melt. Um, filter on the Hirsch funnel, you wash it two times with deionized water and then two times 
with methanol. And then after you've isolated the crude, you're going to recrystallize it using methanol. You need about 10 mils. You're going to heat it up to boiling. It'll only take about four to eight milliliters to get it all, to all go into solution. Um, and then you're going to set it aside to cool and it will recrystallize. And then you can rinse that with cold methanol. And there you go. You're going to scrape that out of the Hirsch funnel and you're going to label that in a vial with the name, your name, your lab section, and of course the name of the product. Next, we'll talk about preparing for the pre-lab. You want to make sure to read the entire experiment, which is 12.2a. If you're a little rusty on your electrophilic aromatic substitution, you'll want to read all of chapter 18 in Klein. Um, part A, this is where your procedures come from, but make sure to read the parts, but make sure to read techniques C and F, which deal with melting point and recrystallization, if you need a refresher on those. What should you have prepared in your the lab notebook before coming to the lab? You need to have a title page with a standard header, the name of the experiment, your name, the date, all on the first page. You can put an abbreviated title on the remaining pages, but on the first name, or on the first page rather, you need to have the complete title of the experiment. Then you're gonna to wanna to have a purpose, okay? And you want that purpose to answer questions like, what are you making? What's the product? How are you doing it? How are you purifying it? How are you going to isolate it? And how are you going to characterize it? This is to be specific, but you don't have to reproduce a procedure or anything like that. Next, we have the table of reagents. You want to put the name, structure, molecular weight, melting, or boiling points as needed. Concentrations for the acids. And then, of course, you're going to put a source at the bottom of that, which can just be the UCCS chemical list found on our classes page in Canvas. Next, you'll want to include the safety, and you want to put that in a tabular form. You want to list the specific hazards of each chemical that's found on the chemical list. You want to have a balanced chemical reaction. You don't have to show a mechanism, but you want to show all three possible products, the meta, the ortho, and the para. Um, don't consider the dinitration side product, and then you want to do a limiting reagent and theoretical yield calculation. And for those calculations, make sure to use the adjusted quantities. And of course, for your procedures, incorporate the changes that I've mentioned in this video. Now, what are the changes that we're making to the procedures? You're going to double all of the quantities that are found in the textbook, except for the amount of water and methanol that are used for washing your crude or your recrystallized product. You're going to increase the addition time for the electrophile to 20 to 25 minutes, so it's a little bit longer. You're gonna recrystallize the crude product from methanol. And though it says here to come in during the week to weigh the final product and to get the melting point, we're gonna to try to do this part, we're gonna to try to do this in the lab to get it all done in one fell swoop. And you should be able to get this done um, relatively easily. In order to make sure that you get a good melting point, you'll just wanna make sure to dry your product on the Hirsch funnel for about 15 minutes. While you're in the lab, you're gonna carry out the synthesis, you're gonna double all the reagents, you wanna be careful, don't rush, because you're handling very dangerous concentrated acids. You wanna be safety conscious. If you happen to spill an acid, you're gonna put sodium bicarbonate on that. Watch where you put your pipettes. Your glass pipettes, and you're done with those, those go in the broken glass, they do not get reused. You make sure to wash your hands um, carefully before you leave the lab and to keep your solutions cold. And as always, take good notes and make good observations in your notebook. Like I said, let your product dry on the Hirsch funnel under vacuum for about 15 minutes, and then you should be able to get your melting point in your final mass before you go home. Of course, you're gonna have calculations, the limiting reactant and theoretical yield. You're gonna to wanna to redo those calculations using the quantities that you actually um, used in the lab. You wanna calculate your percent yield, your percent recovery, and of course, the error in your melting point, and complete the data sheet.